Heavenly Father, this morning we are thankful for your presence, Lord. Lord, today we're simply humbled knowing that you showed up to church with us, God. And we're certain of it by the way that we feel in our spirits that you are with us, God. Lord, your presence fills this room, God. It is unavoidable, undeniable. We are so thankful and so blessed that you continue to faithfully fill this auditorium with your presence, God. Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus, his life his ministry, his death on the cross for our sins, for his resurrection, for his ministry continued until he ascended into heaven where he sits at the right hand of the Father interceding on our behalf today, Lord. Jesus, we thank you for the mercy that you show us, the sweet things that you whisper in the ear of the Father on our behalf, Lord. We are so grateful to be in this place with you this morning. Holy Spirit, continue to move, continue to fill this room. Oh, Holy Spirit, let you just have your way in this place today, God. We'll make as much room, as much time as you need. You are welcome here, God. We love you. It's in your mighty and precious name that we pray. Amen. 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 We'll give somebody a high five and grab a seat this morning. Good morning, church. Good morning. Man. I used to think it was tacky for pastors to talk about how good the weather was, but for Georgia, we're doing pretty good right now. So if you're excited about this weather, I mean, the forecast is actually coming true. That hardly ever happens for us. So I'm very grateful for this weather today. And I just want to piggyback off of what Amanda was saying. I mean, she absolutely hit the nail on the head. We're just so thankful and so blessed to be in this country right now. Amen. 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 And, and I do absolutely with all my heart believe that this is the best country that ever has and ever will exist on this planet. I am grateful that God brought me here, that I am in this place, that you're all here with me, and that we have freedoms that other people do not have. God has been faithful to bless our country, and we are very thankful this morning for those who gave their lives to defend that freedom and fight for it. Amen. Amen. I'm very thankful. My wife and I were having a conversation about Memorial Day this week, and we thought that we might be the only country that celebrates our fallen heroes by having an amazing sail everywhere. Um, if that doesn't speak to the mindset of our country at times, I don't know what will. Um, but I recently, I bought a pair of headphones online, and the box came in, and on the box it said Future Proof. And I got them on sale. <laughs> it was probably a Memorial Day sale. And it said Future Proof. And I read into that, I was like, okay, well, they're going to make more headphones, and things are going to get more technologically advanced. And eventually the headphones are going to wear us because we know where technology is going these days. So I was like, what does it mean by future proof? And I'm looking into it, and they're saying these will last. These will be good enough today and tomorrow and the next day. There's enough built-in features. There's enough going on that this will always be the headphones that you need. Now, that's probably not true because they're probably going to break. There's probably going to be better ones in the future. But I was thinking, you know what? Jesus is future proof. Jesus is absolutely, amen. Jesus... Yesterday, today, and tomorrow was all we will ever need. We're not going to need another Jesus. We're not going to need something better. And that's exactly what I want to talk about this morning. Before I do, I want to just give a quick shout out to our pastors who are not with us this morning, enjoying some time in Nashville with their new granddaughter. Very exciting for them. I'm, we're so blessed that they get to do that, right? What a blessing. And so thank you, Pastor Tori, watching online right now for allowing me to have this platform. I don't take it lightly. I'm very excited to be here with our church family this morning. So we're talking about future proof, right? And, and what I want to look at with that is, is not necessarily what's to come, but what's right in front of us right now. We spend a lot of time 
thinking about the future, if you're ADD like me and, and you spend a lot of time daydreaming, you know who you are, or if you're very type A, very analytical, the future is very important for you as well. We catch ourselves all the time thinking about what's next. But this morning, I want to shift the focus to what's now. That's the title of my message for you guys this morning, what's now. Taking a step away from what's next and really looking at what is right in front of us, is it enough? Because every single day holds the same amount of potential for communion with God. I believe that this morning. Every day has limitless amount of discovery of who God is and how much he loves us. Each day has an infinite level of peace from Jesus. Every single day has unlimited grace and mercy for those who are willing to claim it. But what worries me, church, is, is that we're still drowning in a sea of achievement and striving. We know these things to be true about Jesus, but what's next is so much more important to us than what's now. And hear me clearly on this. Goal setting is important. That's, I'm not saying it's not important. My mom just gave me a look. Planning for the future is important, but we need to be extremely cautious when it comes to our relationship with Jesus. Now, I can't be the only person in the room who at some point during their faith journey may have fantasized about becoming a better Christian than they are today. Raise your hand if you ever thought, I could be a better Christian. I would like to be a better Christian. Thank you. I'm glad that we're all on the same page with that. We think things like, oh, when I get there, when I have that faith, when I know the Bible that well, when I'm that far removed from my sin issues. So what's the point? Pastor Zach is telling us that we shouldn't like, want to be better. Is that what he's saying? No, that's not where I'm going with this. But listen to this. If, criteria, if, if certain criteria must be met before you can enter into the presence of God, then you're doing something wrong. When Jesus shouted as he died on the cross in Matthew chapter 27, we're told that the veil in the temple was torn down the middle. Now, how many of you know the significance of that piece of scripture? See, the veil in the temple was in the holiest of holies. One priest, one time a year, after a purification ritual, was allowed in there to be in the presence of God. That's not a lot of people in the presence of God, right? But... When Jesus cried out his last, it says that the veil was torn down the middle, meaning that Jesus made a way that the presence of God would no longer be separated from us. That's a beautiful thing, and I think we read over that because we're so focused on, my sins are forgiven, oh my gosh, thank God, I'm covered. But Jesus also made a way that we could be in the presence of the living God. And all that is required of us is an awareness that God hears you, he sees you, and he loves you. That's the big picture this morning. I'm not saying you're good where you are. Maybe you are. I don't know. I'm not the judge of that. We all have much to learn as followers of Jesus. There's more growth to be had, more understanding of the word for us to get, and more patience and love for us to grow in, but those things come from being in close proximity to Jesus, right? Spend more time with Jesus, become more patient. Spend more time with Jesus, no more scripture. Spend more time with Jesus, love your neighbor better. It's a very simple formula. The more Jesus I have, the more like Jesus I become. The holdup for most of us as believers is, is we see a scale attached to our spirituality. Let me explain what I mean. The more verses I know, the higher that I am on the scale. The more mission trips that I've been on, the higher up on this scale of spirituality and Christendom I become. The more praying I do, the more fasting I do, the longer that I've been a Christian, the higher up on this scale I am. But can I tell you something that might come as a shock this morning? That that scale is not from God. The scale of spirituality and Christianity or whatever you want to call it, if anything, this proverbial scale comes from the enemy. Because 
The higher up the scale goes, church, the, the smaller we feel. If, if the scale keeps going, if there is an unreachable amount of potential of who I'm supposed to be and where I'm supposed to be, then I'm not going to feel alive and capable where I am right now until I get to that point. Wow, that pastor's been preaching for 25 years. He's so much higher on the scale than me. That nursery volunteer is, has prayed over all the babies a hundred times over. I mean, they're so much further on that scale than I am. I'm so behind. See, the scale invites comparison. If we put our spirituality, who we are, as much as we've done in the church and for Jesus and with Jesus on this scale and look at everybody else, it is only inviting comparison. Galatians chapter 6 verses 4 and 5 say this. Pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done. And you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else, for we are each responsible for our own conduct. Pay careful attention to your own work. You will get the satisfaction of a job well done. Now, at first, that verse might sound contradictory to my point. Is there a scale or is there not a scale, Pastor Zach? Let's talk about it. Is the scripture not telling us right here to measure our works? Is this not a scale? Well, yes, in a sense, we are asked to measure our works, but you have to understand that on the scale of comparison that we so easily reference, we aren't looking at what we've accomplished, but we're looking at what we have not yet accomplished on the scale. When we see what everyone else is doing, we see the slack that we need to make up for as Christians, right? But the scripture clearly says we are not to look upon the works that we have not done, but be satisfied in the works that we have. Then, what does it say? We'll have no need for comparison to anyone else. Who would have guessed that the way out of the cycle of, of comparison was self-love? appreciating the things that have already been done, appreciating how far Jesus has already brought you. I suppose the only other way out of breaking the cycle of comparison is to be the best Christian that's ever lived. First of all, I think that one's already taken. I think Jesus has us beat by a little bit. But also, I think that if you can't sleep until you've become the best Christian in the world, then you're a slave to the religion of Christianity, and, and you're blind to a relationship with the living God. And, and that might sound like harsh language. We're really going to say that you're a slave to a religion? That kind of seems a little weird, but, but those aren't my words. See, Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 6 teaches us this. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. In other words, our allegiance falls to one side or another. In the context of our message this morning, we can be enslaved to striving and reaching or be free in the presence of Jesus. Now, you might see the word money in that verse and think that we're taking it out of context. Pastor Zach, Jesus was clearly teaching on money here, not striving and attaining and I actually hope that you're thinking that way this morning because that means that you guys are locked in using your, what's the word, critical thinking? You're, you're moving. The gears are spinning. If you're thinking like that, then you're with me at least. So let's explain on the mount where he is teaching to thousands of people, basically saying, this is it. This is the rule book. This is how you be a great follower of Jesus. Maybe his best teaching yet. I love that. Jesus says, this is how you do it. I mean, how much better does it get than Jesus saying, this is how you do it? And, and this is part of that sermon, and it's under a passage of Scripture labeled Teaching About Money and Possessions. Okay, point for the critical thinkers. I am 0 for 2 at this point. You got me. Stick with me. Stick with me. Jesus continues in verse 25. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in the barns for your heavenly Father feeds them. 
And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And right here we see Jesus add another layer, another variable to his teaching. Time. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? In just that one sentence, Jesus reminds us of the value of our time on this earth. This also solidifies his prior argument. Be consumed with worry about what you don't have, or trust that God sustains you. Yes, we're in a section of the Bible where money is in the title, but Jesus is cutting much deeper than possessions right here. He's, he's cutting deeper than what we see in the physical, and he's actually diagnosing a condition of our hearts because he knows that we're prone to lust over what we don't have. We think we're all guilty of that. I wish I had that. Well, I can be satisfied when this happens. And maybe it's not a thing, but it's an idea or a status or an accomplishment. If only we had that. Will I serve God or will I serve this? And in the words of Jesus, you will love one and hate the other. It's harsh language, but that's our Jesus. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. Jesus is saying that, that when you want something more than you want what's right in front of you right now, you're going to hate what's right in front of you right now. He's saying if the future is more attractive than the present, then you'll love the future, but you'll hate the present. If that accomplishment, if that financial achievement is more important than what you see right now, then you'll love that, but you'll hate this. That's what Jesus is saying. He continues, verse 31, So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of who? unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Did you catch that? He's calling out the people that think too far in advance to be able to appreciate what's in front of them. The people that are worried about tomorrow, he likens to unbelievers. Where is your faith this morning? Is it in God that he will provide for tomorrow and there's a life to be lived today? Or is your faith in the thing that you don't have yet? That's what Jesus is saying. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Check this out. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. There it is. Jesus says it himself. Today is the most important day of your life. Do not worry about Tomorrow, take it one day at a time. Check your motivations today. Are you using all of your energy? Are you expending yourself thinking about what has not yet come? Or are you using that energy to worship and praise Jesus today? The sun will come out tomorrow. So you gotta hang on till tomorrow, come what may, tomorrow, tomorrow, I love ya, tomorrow, you're always a day away. Heresy! Don't, no, 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 That was a test. You should not have clapped. That is heresy. That is blasphemy. Because if Annie had read chapter 6 of the Gospel of Matthew, then she would know that today holds just as much potential to be in communion with God as tomorrow. How wasteful of us to chase after what's next and where we could be or should be when Jesus is here and now. You don't have to worry about becoming a better Christian and growing into a more mature person because progression and breakthrough are results of time spent with Jesus. Do you see where I'm going with all of this? I want you to be better. Trust me, I do. 
I, I want this church to be on fire. When, when Jesus returns, I want neighborhood church to be ablaze and to be obvious to him that we are serving him with everything that we have. I want us to be set apart, but we can't get there until we lay everything else aside that is not Jesus. You want to get there? Don't let the Christian that you want to be stop you from being the Christian that you are today. Jesus is not waiting in the future for you. He is standing at the door today and he knocks. That's what Jesus says. He's not out there. He's not for the Christian that you're becoming. He's for the Christ follower that you are today. Despite your flaws, despite what you have not done, Jesus did not make a promise that once you have accomplished something, once you've raised up the scale, then he will meet you where you're at. No, he stands at the door and he knocks today. That's our Jesus. But this is what we do. We hear the knocking, and we say, oh, shoot, that's Jesus. Or you say something similar to, oh, shoot, no judgment, we're working on it, that's what he's for. And, and we say, oh, my gosh, Jesus is here. And we hear him knocking, he's going after it, and we're like, okay, uh, hey, Jesus, I hear you, I'll be right there, just stepped out of the shower, I don't know, you're thinking of something to say, and you're like, oh, gosh, okay, let's see, oh, this place is a mess. Oh, my goodness, I, got the, I left my gluttony in the kitchen. I'm pretty sure I read that was a sin. Oh, that's not good. And, oh, whoo, I didn't even notice I left my pornography addiction in the living room. Better scoot that into the bedroom real quick. And, oh, my gosh, selfishness. Did you pee on the floor again? Jesus is here, bad boy. And what we do is we focus on cleaning up our act and getting our heart together before we can let Jesus in. We try and do all this cleaning, but we deny the only person who can actually do it. That's Jesus. I told the youth group a couple of months ago that Jesus could have his own show on HGTV the way he's remodeled my heart so many times. I mean, he's just that good. Open concept. <laughs> but church, can I tell you, he's faithful to do it over and over again. There should be no guilt in saying, man, Jesus already saved me from that. Jesus already cleaned up my act on that. I really, I, I should just figure this out myself first. No, Jesus is faithful to come back and to not and to enter in and to transform our lives if we are faithful to let him through the door every single time. And that, that's just from me saying that because I've lived that. I've experienced that time and time again. The things that I thought I had covered find their way back into my life, but Jesus is faithful to kick them right back out because in the presence of the Lord, sin cannot stay. So why are we trying to get that out before we... that could happen. You open the door, breeze gets in, just close the door. up shop and transforms your entire life from the ground up. And it's not a matter of if he will do that. Jesus, it's faithful to do it. Listen, I pastor your teenagers. I've seen it. I know he can and I know he will. Listen, there's not a person in this room who does not have Jesus knocking at the door of their heart. I promise you. I promise you. Pastor Zach, I don't really think that I've heard any knocking lately. If that's you, then maybe you've been blaring the music too loud. Maybe there have been some voices that have drowned that out. Maybe there have been some distractions that have kept you from hearing what's actually going on. But there's one thing I believe, that when Jesus speaks, when he says something, he means it. Amen? Amen. 
Who's with me this morning? When Jesus talks, it's not wasted. Every single word is rich and is full. And when God makes a promise, he is faithful to keep it. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Jesus himself says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The NLT says we will eat as friends. That's the words of Jesus. I dare you to open up for him. I believe he'll break bread with you. Your savior, your hero, the one who gave his life for you, the one that seemed so far away is actually wanting and desiring to be with you. He didn't say, I will enter in and flip the dining room table in your home. No, he said he will be your friend. And over time, the things you fought so hard to hide become exposed to Jesus. Ooh, that's a little scary, church. The things that you thought you could sweep under the rug, no, Jesus says we're going to do some remodeling. We're going to take a second look at that. Those drapes, are you serious? No. I don't know. Jesus probably had good fashion sense. But Jesus is going to walk around your heart, and nothing will be hidden. And that's not a scary thing. That's a beautiful thing, because he will help you. He will cast it all out until it is you and him sitting at a table enjoying a meal together as friends. That's our Jesus. Listen, every one of us are incapable of achieving our faith goals without Jesus. As much as we try, as hard as we work, if we're not doing it with Jesus in our hearts, then it is wasted. Faith without works is dead. If Jesus is not in it, if he is not behind it and through it and for it, then stay away from it. It's not worth it. Put your focus on him. Take your eyes off of everyone else and everything you wish you were and look at Jesus. Listen, church, your testimony has very little to do with what has not happened yet, but it has everything to do with what God has already done in you, right? Scripture tells us that our testimony is one of our most powerful tools at teaching and telling about Jesus. It's not about where we haven't gotten yet. It's about what he's done, who we were, but who we are now because of the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Amen? And when you look back and see all of the the challenges and the hurdles that you overcame because Jesus was in your heart, then as the scripture says, you can be satisfied with a job well done. That's a promise. I don't want the story of my life to one day be a hundred years down the road. I don't, maybe more than that. I mean, I don't know. I'm 24, maybe 150 years down the road. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? I don't want to stay here any longer than I have to. We see where things are going. My goodness. However many years down the road, I won't limit myself to anything. Let God do what he wants to do. I don't want my legacy to be all the things that I did. Of course, I think about that. I don't want it to be, oh, Pastor Zach, you should have seen how he was preaching. You should have seen the way he changed the world. I don't want it to be that. I think about those things, but what I want people to say is, wow, he was with Jesus. And let me tell you, when you are with Jesus, there is no need for an accomplishment to accompany that title, right? He was with Jesus, and there is no and because you were with Jesus. That's enough. That is good enough. You were with Jesus. Let me tell you, it gets harder and harder every day to get to the end of the day and say, I was with Jesus. You can say, I went to work. I got gas today. I did this, that, and the other. But unless you can say, I was with Jesus, then you accomplish nothing. Church, it's not about doing and being Those things come with proximity to Jesus. Spend time with Jesus, growth is going to happen. But I hope that all of you will will try your best, will give what you have to saying, I am going to commit to being with Jesus today. That's what's now, not what's next. God is not over there. He is not in the future. He is not waiting. He is right here 
ripe for the taking for those who are willing to claim it this morning. Yes, you can make a difference, but there is only one who can forgive someone of their sins and grant them eternity in heaven, and that is not you, it is Jesus. And the same Jesus that wants that for every single person in our community and every single person in this world is the same Jesus that stands at the door and knocks. Will you let him in today? Will you get to the end of your Sunday and say, yes, I was with Jesus. Do not go another day trying to attach things to your title. Let people look at your life and say, man, they were with Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, I pray with everything that I have this morning, Lord, that our legacy, our testimony at the end of time would not be achievements, would not be goals that were met, but would be proximity to you, Jesus. That everybody in this room would get to a place in their lives where they can look back and be satisfied with a job well done, Lord. In the name of Jesus, cast out the scale that we have so grown accustomed to. Lord, cast out the striving for achievement and let us redirect that to a centered focus on you, Lord. Yes, we can have goals, Jesus. Yes, we can have places we want to be, but the second that those become more of a reality than what is right in front of us, that's the problem, Lord. So cast that out today, God. Lord, be with us, be for us. God, if there's somebody in this room this morning who who has not opened up in a long time, who has ignored that knocking at the door of their hearts, who maybe haven't even heard it because there have just been too many distractions and too many things to muffle the sound of God Almighty standing outside of their hearts begging to be let in, then this morning, God, I pray that the distractions would stop, that the enemy would be silenced in the name of Jesus, that they could hear the knocking at the door and faithfully walk to that door and let you in, Lord. This morning, God, we're not concerned about what we've done or or who other people think we are, but there is one opinion that matters, and that is that of Jesus. Lord, so come in. Come in, Lord. Some of us need to invest in a doorstop. Some of us need to take the door off the hinges this morning and just say, I don't care anymore. I'm not even going to have to wait to hear that knocking. Jesus has a one-way ticket into my heart as often as he wants it. Lord, give us that confidence this morning. Remind us that you're not far away. Remind us that you do not only exist in the future, but you exist right in front of us right now. That if we have any hope of achieving anything in the name of Jesus and Christianity and world transformation, then it begins with simply choosing you today. But Lord, we hold you to your end of the promise. That in your presence, darkness will be cast out. Lord, in your presence, we can be made whole. And in your presence, we will move forward and not backwards. And in your presence, we will secure the best future for ourselves. Not worrying about what we will eat, what we will drink, what we will wear, but with a confidence that the God we so lovingly serve will provide those things for us. Those worries are simply distractions put forth by the enemy to keep us from seeing the Jesus that's right in front of us, Lord. We love you. We thank you for your presence, and it's in your mighty and precious name we pray.